Hello, thank you for joining us. This is My Business, Your World. I'm your host, Dr. Graham. Today, my guest is Mr. Phil Andrews. Uh, Phil is the current president of the Long Island African American Chamber of Commerce with services Nassau, Suffolk, uh, Queens, and Kings County. Phil also is the immediate past president for 100 black men of Long Island. He's a founder of PA, public relations company. He has served in several public relation director position in a number of community. Um, also, he has um, served for the PR committee for the Harlem Book Fair of Long Island, which had over 2,000 uh, attendees back in 2003. He's also uh, has been past member or member of the committee of the New York Metro Black MBA Association of the 100 Black Men of Long Island in 95 and in 98. Mr. Uh, Andrews also received the award for Small Business Person of the Year for two branches of the Nassau Council of Chamber of Commerce and the West Indian Roosevelt and uh, the West Indian Chamber of Commerce, respectively. He's also received a number of proclamation and citation, notably from the Town of Hempstead Supervisor, uh, Richard Gordino, and um, also from the former county exec, Mr. Thomas S. Galata, Galata pardon, and um, also um, Assemblywoman Erlene Hooper from the 18th District of Long Island. Uh, Mr. Andrews has worked on a number of different platforms as well um, in terms of publication, includes Black Star News, The New York Beacon, Amsterdam News, Minority and Business Review, The New Network Journal, Newsday Executive Suite, and um, he's been featured uh, in 15 years of minority business development. Um, Mr. Andrews, welcome. Thank, Thank you for you. joining us. Thank you. All right, let's just chat a little bit. I see that you have quite um, an extensive PR background here. And before we go into that, let's talk about it and touch on it. Let's talk about your um, early age years, um, your beginning. I believe you were raised in Brooklyn and um, New York uh, Marcy Housing Development. You attended Brooklyn Intact. So fill us in and tell us a little bit about that journey. Well, it was great. I uh, grew up at a time where they had great values. Uh, I was, I was raised by a great leader in the community, a minister. So I often say that I was a leader as a child. So leadership is not a new concept for me because I've been practicing it all my life. And uh, one of the things that I learned early is that when you read, you can travel around the world and there's no limit on your mind. So I'm an avid reader. Evidently, to succeed, you need to be able to read uh, because reading people are leading people. Well, it's very interesting, and, and before we go anywhere else to talk about, we've covered education, which is so critical and key, and we're in a time period in our current society where this is so detrimental for the success, not just of our youth, but also for our working adults and so on to become acclimated with what are some of the challenges, what are some of the changes that are coming, and how to transition and use transferable skills to become more viable. Mm. But reading gives you an opportunity to, to be very imaginative, to dream, to look at things, to think of things clearly, to ask questions. And for some, it's not necessarily we have the tools and resources in terms of technology. So if you don't want to really sit and read, you can listen or you can watch. There's so many programs. I, for, for one, love the History Channel and, and National Geographic or, or, or so on. So let's talk, uh, I guess, a little bit more about the reading and helping to build leadership. Well, one of the things that I could say is that uh, my current bookshelf is full. <laughs> so I have a Kindle and an uh, iPad and all these other devices, and now I've got 500 and 600 books on those because, you know, uh, for Christmas, I would like to have books. <laughs> I'm just that type of person. But... One of the things I think is that we are, we're innovating where we can read anything. You could read a business book on a line of the supermarket today. You could almost listen to it while you're driving. So we have the ability to use more of our time because years ago we had to go to the library <laughs> to get all these books. So I think that we have more at our touch, uh, fingertips, um, but innovation and reading, because you know, you got to renew your mind. You got to stay motivated because Mental motivation is tied to reading, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So I think reading is uh, just a key area of looking at things in a wider way instead of like looking at a situation narrowly. That's why they say education kind of like what broadens you. Mm -hmm. So I think reading is one of the keys. Uh, I've been reading American Management Association and Peter Drucker for 20 years. So people say, how do you create this success? How do you do that? 
No, I study the top leadership trainers in the world and the father of modern day management, right? So reading to me is very important uh, just because you, you, you don't want to get all your, learn everything through your own experience, do you? No, you want to tap into the knowledge base that's already out there. Because it helps to expand. Now, um, rein that in a little bit with um, some of your community work. And it, the reason why I'm going to harp on this note is because education is so critical. And reading helps to develop you as an individual so that you can see the opportunities. How or what can you do, especially when you're put or you're in a particular situation or circumstances that it's not easily navigated? Uh, you can talk about either tough neighborhoods or it could be just financial hard times, but this is what it, it helps to equip you. And as business leaders, as business individual, it is something that is important. Do you That's want to true. chat about that a little? One of the things I've been a big advocate of thinking grow rich. And I think uh, over the years in reading so much, I tried to form the habit mm -hmm. of any book that I started, I finished. Now think about that. When you, fin when you start a book and you finish it, that shows you a good habit in life about other things that you may start and finish. So I think that reading is very critical because, you know, things change. You know, so sometimes you may have to find an idea that you heard about in a book. You know, uh, I remember one time I wasn't on a computer like I am on social networks, right? So things change through reading and understanding. And one of the things my teacher said to me early on in school if you could read, you could probably do math. And you probably could do other things, too, because reading is a key core of our society. Fundamental. Right? So if you can read, you probably can count. You know, but if you can't read, look how many things you won't be able to do. Correct. It's very, very important. Now, tell me a little bit about some of your work in some of these organi uh, organizations that you've been involved with and leading up to taking on the role for um, starting the Long Island African American Chamber of Commerce. That's, uh, many years ago, I was on the board of directors of the Roosevelt Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I was on the board for the uh, Kiwanis. Uh, also, the New York Metro uh, MBAs, that's the largest chapter of black MBAs in the country. I was on their PR committee, and I happened to be able to serve on that time when they honored President Clinton. So it was an honor to be in that space and to bring that talent because sometimes like through our community and activity, uh, I believe that organization is very important. Small organizations all across the country control communities. They have a lot of power. So you, got, you think them groups ain't powerful? They organize, right? They meet every month. They organize. So it's, it could really lead to uh, business development, relationship development, and brand development because in particularly some organizations, if I serve on the board with you and we regularly go in to meetings every month, it's a given that one, at one point we'll do business, right? Because we have a, a affinity to the same organization. Why do you think multi-million dollar corporations sit on boards? Because it's a given that it's gonna create some opportunity and it's also a branding opportunity, I believe, for the organization that not only do they care about money, but they care about giving back. Um, two things real that just came up. One, branding. The other is the opportunity to network and build a network. And I run a personal development group, and one of it, what we share, I share with them, is that 80% of any job leads or any opportunities you're going to have, business opportunity, comes through networking. We don't realize that within seven seconds, the first seven seconds, an impression is formed. So your brand, your image is very important. If you're looking for a job, or you're trying to solicit that client. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a, it, it's very involved to get a lot of small business to really come out and to listen and to hear what opportunities are there for them because the failure rate is really high. One of the reasons for bringing this program is to try and do just that, get a compelling message out, let them see what opportunities are there because then we'll provide a, a very diverse group of guests that comes in with different background that are individuals that they themselves know or have worked with in the past, but to kind of help to guide, champion that project. Let's just talk a little bit about networking and branding. Well, one of the things, um, I'm known as a master networker, uh, and I've probably done more speeches um, in networking uh, than most people. And one of the things is that God didn't create us with all one ability. So there's some things that we lack 
that we may gain in the network, right? If I lack persistence and I stand next to you, I may gain persistence. So the network is going to give you skills because I believe that our own skill could only take us so far, right? Because everybody's God given everybody else different ability. But when we put those callings together, if I put my calling together with Graham Consulting, right? Her calling is lifted to another level. So, uh, but one of the things is we don't have no course on networking. I mean, now most people, they just hear about how to network. And you see how some people network. They push their card in, the, in your hand, and then when you get home, you throw it in the garbage. So networking is a skill. Networking is you have to be a good, extremely good listener, right? And I also believe that the longer you stay in the networking, more value you could get. Because it'll take time for me to get to know, like, and trust you. It'll, get time, it'll take time. I may know some... I don't know some things about you right now. You may play golf, right? And I, know, I may learn that on a 20th networking session with you. So when we bond, it takes time because you wouldn't want everybody just meeting you just to ask you everything about your life, right? So you could connect and click, right? So what happens though is over a period of time, we feel comfortable. We'd be like, I like this person. I know this person. And you always hear, we do the business with people that we know, like, and trust. So networking um, is often considered the eighth wonder of the world. It's almost like the law of compound interest. It's almost like the sun. We don't know everything why it works, but when we show up and we do it right, things begin to work for us. Well, it's the same concept that flows into if you build your brand, you're networking, you will be able to build good sales because it's all everything is about relationship. And in order to be a good or effective salesperson, listening is critical, detrimental, and you have to have those skills where you can build trust. They must be able to trust you. Nobody's going to trust you right away, not unless that product or that brand has been vested. That's so it takes, it takes a lot, and um, even though you try to train uh, individuals or even business owners about building relationship, as you, you shared, it's just passing the card. For some people, that guerrilla strategy works. Um, I have individuals who are very successful who have just put in, in their mail or so on and passed a card because it, it is. But I think the common courtesy you have to remember, if you only have 15 seconds, not 30 seconds, but 15, if you've made your impression in the first seven, you only have seven in which to say, hi, I'm so-and-so, and this is my business, can I hand you the card? And move it right along, especially if the conversation is not where you want to. Let somebody spark some interest and become engaged. Why are you here? pay in. We do not, you know, a lot of us take for granted that you have to pay in, but you want others to always be, you're always taking, you know, withdrawing from, from relationship and you're not paying in. Some of the pay-ins or the payback out takes a longer time, but it, if you nurture that relationship, it's vested. The rewards usually comes, it's usually a, a, a really good payout. Well, there was a gentleman that wrote a book, uh, and he talked about, uh, how, what if I provide you with your ideal client? If I gave you your ideal client, it's a given that you're gonna do business with me. And give us gain. So uh, one of the things is, the reason why I'm such a staunch advocate of networking is that when you give value to people, right? You can't give value to people if you don't listen. Right, you trying to give them something that you supposed, you, they don't even want. What about if you was a hunter and you supposed to be a farmer? You know, a hunter just goes and hunt. A farmer cultivates things and they grow. So there's, a, there's levels that are of mastery. I mean, sure, there's people that use different approaches, but I know some people like that, and they just go from people to people, but they never invested in Dr. Graham and saying, you know, there's some value here. And that may be the relationship that leads to millions of dollars, but I'm not even paying attention because I'm hunting, because I'm hunting all the time. I just want to uh, just put an ad lib in when you mention sometimes, because this, the reality is sometimes we're in positions or in uh, markets that it's not really true what we really meant for us, so therefore we're not necessarily successful, and you just brought that up. So whether it's you're going for a job, you're looking for the next client, where is it that you're looking for? And this can go, we can go right into talking about marketing, marketing strategies. How do you identify those opportunities? Because we're saying that there's no opportunities and so on and so forth, but there's tremendous amount of growth opportunities and different markets are evolving. 
as some evolve, some phase out, but newer opportunities are there. How do you transfer into these opportunities that you're looking for for your business to be um, become or you continue to be successful or for you to continue to grow? Well, one thing is customer satisfaction. You know, if you if you satisfy a customer, boy, he can go on. You know, some people could talk about that that experience a whole bunch. They could tell a thousand people. So customer satisfaction leads to word of mouth. And uh, but you got to have some type of lead generation. There's always lead generation in every business. And guess what? You don't need a lot of money to have lead generation. If you tell a thousand people through communication, using verbal communication, that's lead generation. Because it's a point of contact. Now, I also believe that marketing is the total communication link to the public. It's everything you say and do. I was on time today, right? That's a marketing <laughs> concept. How would you consider marketing if I was on late? I was late and I was trying to do business with you, right? That's not good. Is that good marketing? No. Or well, my tie was on backwards, right? <laughs> so everything that we do is, is marketing. So that's why we got to think that everything that communicates and says something about your business is a very key component to business. But a lot of people don't look at all the anchors, the little things, you know, like marketing. You talk, we were just talking about business cards. That person that's shoving that business card in your hand, that's marketing. Is it good marketing or bad marketing? So I think we have to look at understanding that today people know what good service is. They've got a level of expectation of excellence. And to be small, a small doesn't have nothing to do with how much you make in a business. Because you can be a world-class business from the day that you have one customer. Is that right? Yes. All right, let's talk a little bit about, um, we'll probably come back and I'm sure there are other things to talk about in marketing and we talk a little bit probably about you know, some of the SEOs or social media strategies that are out there that can help small businesses. Let's talk about um, the chamber. How or what got you started? on this and what made you take on this role? Well, I got a phone call. I just happened to finish my last job and somehow I just got a, uh, a phone call because I do believe that God have things planned for us and then sometimes we don't have things planned. Uh, I had no intention of being the chamber president because I was the membership chairman prior to that. But then when my prior position was ended, they called and asked me to be the president. But this is something that is passionate because business is passionate. I'm passionate about business. Business is a very important concept. Organization, uh, to have a, a business organization in the African American community, to let the world know this is a market here that we could do business with. So I understood it because I, hey, I was a prior two sm small, small business person a year for two chambers of commerce. So you know to be a small business person of the year for two different chambers, I must have been doing something right at those chambers of commerce. And the chamber is essentially still like a business entity. It has a, it has a tax ID. It has, it, has, it has a name, right? So we have to drive the chamber just like we drive business. So it takes a certain skill set and mindset, like with all of those things we're talking about, marketing, networking, you know, and some other things, uh, because we, it's, you, you got to have skill. You can't just talk about, oh, I want a great business. I want a great organization, because today you need skills. And you also got to be the right person that could carry the message. All right. So tell me a little bit about some of, um, we're probably coming up on a break. Uh, we usually do a couple. I'm not sure uh, as yet. So just really quickly, tell me um, a few things about some of the initiatives because it's a relatively new chamber of commerce and you stretch quite an expanse from one tip of the island to the next. Well, one of the things that we're doing is the governor recently uh, announced uh, that 30% of all businesses were going to go to minority companies. And we're preparing the community to certify small business owners and then working with government entities to kind of make this as a model process, something that has never been done, how a chamber will work with uh, a university under the state or a hospital to supply minority business. And the reason why this minority business is very important is that all taxpayers in a particular community or state pay taxes. So if they decide to go into business and they get certified that they really are real business, 
they should be able to do business with the state. So it's really a way of uh, just leveling the playing field. Uh, this conversation has been going on since I was in my 20s. But now it's a, uh, the governor of New York has set the highest percentage in the nation. So, but he can't do that without organizations and us equipping ourselves because if we don't have nobody that could deliver that tire, that uh, that uh, tire for the uh, the MTA or something like that, or a train. How are we gonna deliver that train if we ain't got nobody in the train business? So we are preparing the community, and they buy the government buys everything. They buy paper clips. You could sell a hundred thousand paper clips to the government. You could sell. Uh, Napkins, anything that you use and you see in the government, somebody's got to buy that, sell, somebody's on that furniture when you go into the Social Security Administration. Because the governor is not in the business of selling furniture, is it? Yeah. Well, um, let's go to the next break and let's talk about it a little bit more because um, w there are certain opportunities there, but also we have to kind of look at you just naming a couple of different industries. How does it impact? So, again, Thanks for joining us. My guest today is Mr. Phil Andrews, who's a current uh, cha uh, chamber president for the Long Island African American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this is My Business, Your World, and I'm your host, Dr. Graham. Thank you. Okay. My name is Dr. Robert Brevard. I'm here for Multimedicine in Westbury, New York. We're located at 1065 Old Country Road, Suite 214 been here for about 15 years. The practice has medical doctors, physical therapists, chiropractors, acupuncturists. We also do pain management and we have orthopedists on staff. Here at Advanced Multimedicine Rehabilitation, we've got physical therapists on staff who treat an array of conditions from neck pain to back pain, shoulder pain. We treat carpal tunnel. We treat a lot of car accident patients, slip and falls. We treat patients with knee injuries, with ankle injuries. We have state-of-the-art equipment. We've been here for over we do 15 years. We a vast array of diagnostic testing from x-rays to EMGs. What is an EMG? It's a diagnostic test that allows a doctor to determine where the pinched nerve is. Cora is a physical therapist at Advanced Multimedicine and Rehabilitation. She's working on Stephanie, who was involved recently in an automobile accident. Stephanie has tight thoracic and cervical musculature, and Cora is doing some myofascial release work and some therapeutic stretching doing it to help her with her pain. Vicki is also a patient here at Advanced Multimedicine and Rehabilitation. Vicki is now working her leg muscles, specifically her quadricep muscles, trying to strengthen them after an injury she sustained. find yourself in need of any type of physical therapy, please don't hesitate to call Advanced Multimedicine and Rehabilitation. Located in Westbury, New York, in Suite 214. Phone number is 516-334-7000. Hello, thank you again for joining us. This is Dr. Graham, My Business, Your World. Again, my guest is Mr. Phil Andrews, uh, Long Island African American Chamber of Commerce uh, President. Phil, we were just chatting about the MWB and um, this push by the governor for 30% um, increase in that. We're looking at, in just in general, women-owned businesses or women doing very well, uh, pushing through glass ceilings and, and getting minimum management positions. Now, what I find is oftentimes while there are opportunities, they're still limited. How are you going about, because here you're pushing for 30 percent, not just you, and your the uh, chamber has initiatives and, and plans or programs to help to help make that mark, which is significant, and obviously will help to build business, build the economy, job opportunities, and so on. What are some of the areas? Because it's usually, like you're saying, you know, if they want tire, someone to deliver the tire, it's usually mostly product driven. There's some services, but it's not the atypical services that most are providing. I know that I have a consulting firm as a minority um, business owner, it may not be looking for some of the things that we do, and the chances of, even though you have that certification, may take a while. One area of our business is sustainability, conservation, biodiversity, and energy efficiency. So there is opportunities for us to get on some of these bigger projects with other companies, and at some point maybe take the lead. But chat a little bit about 
it's one thing to become certified and have that certification, but what are the opportunities to have this work for you? Well, it's very vast. Uh, we've met with some agencies uh, with the General Services Administration, meaning general services. And they told us, we buy everything. We buy paper clips. We buy, we may have a local small party in the office catering. But they, uh, since the law is there, they're under a mandate from the governor. You know, when the governor signs a law, it's a big deal. And you don't do 30%. I'm sure that, you know, some people, uh, you know, they, they monitor these things. This is a national movement across the country. It's been some time, uh, it, came, it stemmed uh, eventually uh, from people being locked out of opportunities. But we've arrived into a new day where wealth is going to be in the communities, uh, the, some lower social economic communities, some higher communities. And the majority firm, they, they bring in on, if they get 100% of the contract, they have to supply 30%. But guess what? 30 different type of companies could make up that 1%. If you got 1%, they need to give somebody else another 1%, and it's the 30%. But the business is so, I mean, it's so vast, garbage bags. You can get garbage bags from uh, Staples, can't you? And probably find out, does these bags qualify with the bid, say? So in uh, or, or like a courthouse, CDs. You think they got to use uh, some type of CD case in their courthouses and they document it? I know somebody that once sold over 100000 right here in, 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 the, in the county next door. So it's things that, some of the things is what your code is. Whatever your code is, is that's what you could do. So some of your code, it doesn't have to be like, overly complicated of something. It could be a wholesale retail. What about even if it was on the federal level, the army, they need t-shirts. You imagine how many, how many soldiers get t-shirts, white t-shirts? I was in the service. So it's not, um, some of the things is just thinking about the business that you want to do. Now everybody's not going to be in that construction type of trade. There's going to be people in, what about video services like this, this TV studio right here? The government needs somebody to document a video, but you got to be certified. So it could be, a certified also means a woman, woman-owned. It could mean Indian. It could mean, um, you know, different ethnic groups. Asian, it's minority business enterprise. And women are double minority because they've been locked out. Their percentage is so low, so they give you double credit. And they're really trying to increase the amount that women do. Because, you know, the male in this country uh, at one time was getting all the business. So this is basically just making it... Um, a more equal society. Okay. Now, um, I guess opportunities to look at, and I hope this is something that you also, you're sharing like about the codes and so on, is where those p possibilities are because it may be something that a small business owner, I, you know what, I can actually design t-shirts. Are they really looking for, is there a need, is there a lack for an, in an area that they're not getting, so then you can be trained and prepared for, well, for those. I think that more so than anything else, because there's, they need certain things, but how frequently do they need it or they're, they're using it? And you have to be able to look at those areas that there, it's probably a natural transition for that particular business. Well, one of the things that I'm a big advocate of is technical assistance. They are the Small Business Administration, uh, helps you with uh, loan programs. They have some type of online training. SBDCs, which is funded by our taxes, small business development, what they call technical assistance. You know, technical assistance is very important. I'm going to give you an example of that. I had 10 stores and 100 employees in my 20s, right? You know, having one store is not like having 10. You know, it's like when you manage, that franchise that when you, when you manage one, one baby, right, then mm -hmm. you got 10 kids, it becomes different. So sometimes we need technical, what we call technical advice, is sometimes we don't know certain things that we don't know. So I would advise people that want to get into business to visit their small business development center, right? We pay taxes. This whole country is built around business. And someone once said, one president once said, the business of America is what? Business, right? But so we, there's technical assistance, because uh, sometimes you may not know certain things. There's people that counsel hundreds of millions of businesses. And, you, and, and uh, you know, a lot of times businesses got the same problems, right? Cash flow problems, management problems, problem that they doing everything themselves, you know. Uh, so there's some people out here that could help you assess your business. And just like you, do you ever have to bounce something off somebody, an idea?
to stay on the right course. So today we have all these technical assistance programs all across the country and the college. You have one here at Farmingdale University. Stony Brook has a small business development center. So even the chamber, we're not going to try to be everything to everybody because some of our tax money funds programs to help us get in business. And then, you know, when you go into bu to business and you make money, what happens? Then you pay taxes, right? So this whole country is built toward business development. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about, I want to backtrack because I don't think we've quite finished uh, talking about, and you brought up that you served in the, 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 the um, Armed Forces or the Navy, is it? Y yes, the Navy. Um, as well. So let's talk about some of your formative years and you, you know you talked about you know reading and understanding that reading is what was important to getting you to where it is we'll rein in when we're chatting about that let's talk a little bit about mentors and any mentors that you've had i know that you're a certified mentor as well so we'll from there we'll probably talk a little bit with the you know rain, talk about with that relationship with the 100 black men as well well i was always uh, very uh fortunate in my life there was some older people always around and they told me things, you know, and I listened. So sometimes, you know, a conversation can change your life. It could empower you. But if you don't listen, you know, like one of my guy, uh, mentors, he was a Tuskegee Airman. And he would take me to the, to the people, the place, the homeless shelters where they fed him. He said, Phil, maybe one day you could do this. You could develop something where we could help, the, help our community in shelters and feed them. So, it, but they just was great guys. I mean, and then I sat under great leaders. I mean, I, I sat under men that said I never met a man that I could not like. I sat under other men that says, you know what? I love Argyle socks. So we just had these great guys. They was just uh, great leaders and we just wanted to spend time around them. And then, you know, one day, one of them always said, as I am today, you shall one day be. As he get older, then we become those great leaders. So being around uh, great leaders and being around great people and hearing great conversations is very important. In the military, that helped a lot too. I mean, come on, discipline. How important is discipline? You know, I mean, how important is typing? You know, I learned how to type in the military. And back then in those days, they put paper <laughs> over your keys. You couldn't see the keys. So you had to learn how to type right. So every skill, and I tell young people or any adult in the community, Everything that you learn somewhere along the line, down the line, you're going to use it in life. Mm -hmm. So you may, you got to pay attention to what you need and, and develop uh, the skills at the time. And then later on, you may need that. You know, it's so important. And I, I've shared that as well from even in my own development that I've looked back and uh, what do I need to do with math? I'm pretty good at it, but I don't really like it that much or something. And then when you get into the finance world or the financial world, the accounting world, and not just those worlds, just business and personal life, all these gadgets that we use, and not even just the gadgets, they're right in there. They've just made it so much easier. And if you'd paid attention, it would make that calculation that you need to do so much easier for you to, to really understand. But, but it, is, it is. Somebody told me once, what if you had a million dollars and you put the digit in the wrong place? <laughs> you'll be glad, you'll be happy that you had the education not to do that because mm -hmm. You may have wrote the check that all the money that you had in the bank went down to zero. Mm -hmm. So education is very important. It really is. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about mentorship. And you, people who have mentored, you were talking about some great um, individuals who took on leadership role for you. Let's talk about any one particular mentor or mentors that stood out for you, and do you have any mentors now? And then we'll get into about people or individuals. That well, I sat under, um, in my prior position, I sat under seven, about seven presidents of the 100 black men. And I was long <laughs> well capable of being president of the 100 black men many years ago. But you know, leadership is a service concept. So he who serves, who wants to be the greatest leader must become the greatest servant of them all. But leadership really teaches you a lot about yourself. Because even in the area of mentoring, if you tell a kid, don't put that paper on the floor, and then you did it, you're exercising poor leadership. I was at a conference one time with 100 Black Men of America, and a kid was throwing away the milk. And then uh, the mentor told him, don't throw away the milk because it's good to you. It's good for you. And the next day, he saw the young man teaching another young man about that little ounce of milk that you're throwing <laughs> away. 
you need the vitamin C. <laughs> so we mentoring is uh, very important. It teaches us something about ourselves when we try to work with another human being because the mentor just, it's a two-way street. It's not just the mentor, I'm giving to mentor, the mentor is giving me. If I'm late, the mentee says, well, you're late, you need to be on time. The next time I got to be on time. So it's a two-way conversation when you, when you deal with mentoring. But it is known as the gift that keeps giving. And mentoring just keeps giving and giving and giving and giving and giving. Time flies by fast when you're having fun. I think we're up on our next break. Let's pick it up back. And I want to talk a little bit more. I'd like to learn a little bit more about um, the, the role in terms of some of the community things that for 100 black men and um, some of your mentorship or your, the individuals or companies that you mentor. Again, this is Dr. Graham uh, with my guest, Mr. Phil Andrews on My Business, Your World. Thank you for joining us, and we'll be right back. Are you planning an event and want to include entertainment, but you're not sure where to turn? Act1Entertainment.net has provided over 1,500 events with quality, affordable live entertainment at private parties, corporate affairs, festivals, bike rallies, and more. Act1 will fit into your budget. They're friendly, reliable, and do all the legwork for you. They take all major credit cards. Log on to Act1Entertainment.net for a free, no-obligation price quote, or call 631-758-3505 for a brochure. You'll be happy you did. Hello, thank you for joining us again. This is My Business, Your World. I'm your host, Dr. Graham, with my guest, Mr. Phil Andrews. Um, Phil, we're chatting about mentor and mentorship. Um, we, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about maybe incorporating 100 black men and what they do in terms of mm -hmm. some of those community programs are on, on a bigger scale uh, where they are when they started and where they are today you're talking about having being president you're still fully capable of taking on that role but we still have which is true it's a team you must be there to help and guide the support and one person doesn't know everything I would love to know everything but not in, in, a, in a negative way because I love to learn but that's the only way you're going to. There are things that they're not going to even be able to impart, but collectively you can make the organization more effective. That's true. Talk a little bit m more about, I guess, some of your work there mm -hmm. and while you were president, and then tell me about the, being a certified mentor yourself. Well, one of the things I was fortunate to be, uh, I have the, pres the uh, privilege of being the immediate past president. And um, as a immediate past president, anybody knows that when you're president or anything, it's a tremendous amount of responsibility. And one of the things that I was able to do is really uh, bring the organization into the community where they were able to see activity, a lot of collaboration with a lot of organizations. Uh, I mean, I did so many varied things. We even, I even had the opportunity to close the, uh, ring the NASDAQ bell. And it went all, <laughs> when I rung that bell, it went all around the world and every news wire in the world uh, so talk about marketing that we was talking about. And I got that call when I was the president the, the, the day before, and there was an emergency, and they needed us. And it was a snowstorm that day. Mm -hmm. And I was able to take three of our members, and the Jersey president came down to ring the bell. But that's, that was a big deal because 
That was once in a lifetime opportunity for 100 black men of America. Mm -hmm. But we just happened to have the NASDAQ in New York City, and they reached out to Long Island, and I got that opportunity. So showing up and being involved, uh, I started somewhere in my 20s, which is very unusual for a young man of 25 years to have the time he's 50 to have 25 years and 100 black men. And we just, it was a social club. Uh, it was just the idea of men coming together to enjoy each other's company and to, that have operated uh, on the level of excellence. I mean, these men, they believe that they turned over every, every stone. And they even would say, I'm bad. And if I'm bad, somebody must be talking, if somebody's talking about me, I must be bad. But it was that type of excellence. And I think a lot of it had to do with coming out of the struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, these guys were the first commissioner, the first ju African American judge, the uh, brigadier general that got a letter from the White House to, to do his service of uh, a leader in the, in, the, in the army. So when you have these guys that's just, they was bad. They was, but they worked hard. They had the education, and and they were saying we went, we will not be denied. And I grew up under those type with the guy with the argyle socks. God is saying I never met a man I could not like. So we had these conversations about them when we talked to them about other. You know, just getting around with great people, it makes you great. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the things that we was able to do. Uh, and we just. It was, a, it was a great concept of a structure, you know, because we got to have structure, too. We can't be unorganized. Mm -hmm. So the, the logo even stood for men coming together under structure. And we need to be a structure because we need to have ways that we operate. We need to have rules. We need to have procedures. And I just happened to just be fortunate to be a past president because being a president of anything, I mean, if you take it with pride, you know, the president takes the job home. <laughs> Everybody else is sleeping. The president is up working. And he's thinking about the problems that he has when everybody else, I know when I was president, I was the first one at the meeting and I was the last one left. And I often would, the president do whatever he had to do. I had great presidents that I served that they would sweep the floor. They would sweep the front of the building. They had pride in it. It was like a certain pride in getting to that position. And as a president, you, you would hope that other people below you would take that same pride in the organization you do. If the president worked right, you're supposed to do like the president. Right? Lead by example. So uh, it just, uh, I was just fortunate um, to have that. Uh, but I knew I had the leadership skills because I had invested in myself way before I became this president or that president because I was reading like the American management, the top leadership training about quality. I was studying total quality in the human being equal total quality in the product. So I, I, was I just love to read. So and, and having that knowledge and then bringing that along with the experience kind of helped because sometimes you need book knowledge too, right? You just can't have activity knowledge. Just do everything without reading the book, right? Without having no knowledge. And you know how important the academia is and having certain knowledge and core basics about information. So when you put together the experience of 25 years and the reading those